to start out with a reading. We'll go right into our worship. And then very anticlimactic, you'll have me again. Come on. A reading from Luke 24. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they prepared. Somebody say the Spice Girls were there. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? That's a great. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still with you in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Let's stand together for the first song. like or stand on your chair or stage dive from the piano. Just be careful.
Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels sing. Hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Hallelujah. Sing ye hymns in the reply.
your blood speaks a better word than all the empty pleas I've heard upon this earth it's righteousness for me and stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood So if we were in one of those old country churches right now, those old Nazarene country churches out in wherever, I would be yelling out, he is risen, and you guys would be yelling out what? He is he risen, is risen indeed. indeed. There he goes. Let's do it one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. You. Happy Easter, everybody. You know, today we're joining with churches all over the world and churches all throughout, all throughout the centuries in celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fact that it was love that caused him to come from the throne room of heaven to be here among us. And he walked around and for 30-something years, 33 years. And it is love that sent him to the cross to die for us sacrificially and to save the, us and the entire world from their sins. So today we celebrate. Today we're worshiping the risen Jesus. There is a guy named Dr. S.M. Lockridge. 
and he was part of the civil rights movement. He marched with Martin Luther King, and he was also a great, great preacher. And if you ever went to one of those all African American, I spent some time in an all African American church preaching, and I, I'll tell you, it was, I learned a lot from those guys, a lot from, I was at part of an ordination service, and I watched, and I was like, wow. Um, but Dr. Lockridge, you've all heard his sermons, bits and pieces of them. Every pastor has gleaned from them. If they haven't, it's because they're too young and they don't know who he is. But I'm going to, the first one he did, you heard last week, actually. Uh, it's, oh, la, 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 la. Here comes the king, my king, my king. And we played that, that message last week. But he had another one called It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Just the title alone wins me. And Tony Campolo hijacked it. And then he wrote a book about it. But the fact is, I want to give you three minutes of this great preacher. And we have some, uh, the passion is linked behind it. But it's Friday and Sunday's coming. Give him a listen, please. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling and his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands God, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. microphone. Ah, thank you. And Easter being Sunday. But, you know, it's still not over either. I mean, it's Sunday, but 
Jesus is coming too. It doesn't stop. You know, it's, he is coming back. He promised to come back. Today we're really, it's about Easter today and we're celebrating today and we're launching into a new series called Love Reigns. So for the month of April, you can say it's all going to be all about love. We're going to look at how love transforms your past, your present, and your future. Speaking of love, Huey Lewis in the News had a song, The Power of Love. Anybody remember that song? Huey got it. You know, I mean, he really understood, but I think a lot of people underestimate the power of love. You know, I mean, I would argue that love is the strongest force in the universe. You know, and men, all the men sitting here, and maybe you ladies too, You've done some pretty crazy things to maybe capture the heart of someone that you care about. I mean, for me, I just remember, you know, girls, you have no idea. <laughs> girls were scary when we were kids, you know. They were like, I don't know if they had cooties or whatever it was, but, I, I, you know, I was afraid to talk to girls. I didn't grow up with any sisters. And then I saw this girl at a freshman year in high school, and she was at the locker, you know, and I was like, whoa, I got hit. You know, I got thunderstruck, man. I didn't even know how to approach her. It took me a while to work up the guts. You know what I ended up doing? I followed her home from school one day. How creepy is that? You know, and she had no clue who I was. And then I got her phone number. I didn't even talk to her. I just followed her. Oh, my God. I'd be arrested today. <laughs> and then I called her up. I found her phone number because back then, a lot of people didn't have unlisted numbers. You could look in a phone book and find people's numbers, the landlines. And um, she goes, uh, but I don't know you. <laughs> I'm Charlie. I don't know you, you know. And then her older brother got on the phone. Little did I know my little brother and his friends were listening to me on an extension in the other room. It's the most embarrassing moment of my life. And Lee used to say she was not impressed with me whatsoever. So nothing happened. But I think a lot of people will risk total embarrassment and they'll go all out, you know, whatever it is to try to impress or capture someone that they care about. We will do anything to show those that we do care about how much we do care. I mean, I, seriously, I will, I will do anything to protect those that I love and those that I care about. I will, and I think you will too. You know, so love is the driving force behind any of our sacrificial actions for family and friends. And like I said, we'll gladly pray any price just to demonstrate that. And love is powerful, and it moves us to do amazing things. It really does. So you have to think about it. Before there was an Easter Sunday, it was Friday. It was a horrible Friday. I don't like calling it Good Friday. I prefer to call it Horrible Friday. I mean, it was good because the atonement was finished on the cross, but it was a Horrible Friday. You kind of saw, imagine the 3 o'clock, God turned out the lights and the sky went dark. And then all of a sudden, you heard that horrible cry. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? That had to be the worst moment going. And then the earth trembled and shook and the curtain split in half. It was just amazing the things that were happening. And all of, all of hell is rejoicing. Yeah, we got him, man. And Jesus even submitted to death. There was that day in the middle, Saturday. You know, but then on Sunday, wow. You know, all of a sudden, so before there was ever a resurrection, there had to be a death. But then on the third day, the silent lamb that died on the cross came out as the lion of Judah and came out in the raw and the power of the resurrection. He is risen, and he is risen indeed. And it's Friday, but Sunday's coming, and Sunday's Easter here, but Jesus is coming back too. I just want to make a few points. The first one is there can only be one king. You know, I mean, for 33 years, Jesus walked the earth serving the hungry, healing the broken, delivering the oppressed. He announced the coming kingdom of God. He claimed to be the son of God. And many people understood him to be the king of all things. And that kind of thinking and teaching got him in a lot of trouble back then because Rome was, was a ruler over Israel, or over a lot of the, the Middle East there. And then they put King Herod as a vassal king in charge of Israel. And they said, basically, you handle them, you keep them contained so we don't have to worry about it anymore. King Herod was crazy. King Herod killed his wife. He killed his three sons. And he would have killed his brother, but his brother died before he could get to him because he was afraid they were all plotting to get to his throne. He was an absolute tyrant. And any other potential king coming in would have rocked the whole boat. So the Jewish leaders, the Roman centurions, they plotted together to have Jesus arrested. And he's, he's brought, brought to trial for his claims to be God. They nearly beat him half to death. And then he's forced to carry that rugged wooden cross up to the hill of Golgotha that he would be killed upon. I want to do the reading from Matthew 27. 
as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. That would be that station right there of the cross. And all of a sudden, Simon came in, and then boom. Um, let's see, where are we? They came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Can you imagine? And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, king of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified him, one on his right, one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. And they were saying, you, are you going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. And in the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, those elders, they mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we'll believe in him then. <laughs> you know, the crucifixion was marked by ridicule and disbelief. And the soldiers mocked him when he put that sign up over his head that they didn't believe it, but it was meant as a mock. Little did they know. You know and, and those who passed by mocked him, just yelling, hey, he can't even save himself. If he's the son of God, how come? What's, what's going on? The priests and teachers are mocking him. These are, and these are the priests. These are the religious leaders. And they're mocking him, saying, you know what? Get off the cross. Then we'll believe you're the king. None of them really understood that the true test of Jesus' power and authority. We missed this. It wasn't in his ability to save himself from the cross. The true test was three days later to raise himself from the dead. That was the test. And sometimes we miss the proof of Jesus' lordship. Because we're expecting him to prove himself in a certain way, and then he does something completely different. And a lot of us decide in our hearts that we're never going to trust Jesus. A lot of people, I'm saying a lot of us, but a lot of people, unless he meets our expectations, you know, uh, unless he heals my relative, unless he gets me that job, you know, uh, unless he stops world hunger and gets the kids out of St. Jude's Hospital. Unless he writes something in the sky, you know, and we always say, like, if there was a God, how could he let this happen? They, they never allow themselves to see him as king unless he does what they want him to do, you know. And that's the same mentality and, and, and teaching that Herod and the Pharisees fed into when they became part of the death of Christ. And when we demand to see Jesus prove himself on my terms, then I miss the work of God in my life, and so do you. You know, the world always says, show me and I'll believe. But Jesus flips the switch and he says, no, you believe and you'll see. Herod wasn't the last one to be threatened by this kingship and rule of Jesus. And he wasn't the last one to struggle with Jesus being in charge either because we all have a hard time with that today. Yeah. Look, <laughs> in our lives there can only be one, I, we all have different worldviews, but there can only be one king as well. And it's been said that whoever sits on the throne of your heart reigns in your life. So we have to choose whether I'm going to sit on the throne of my life or I'm going to let Jesus sit on the throne of my life. If I sit on the throne of my life, then I'm calling the shots. And I'm going to make all my decisions based around me. It gets kind of self-centered, you know. And it's my life and I'm going to do what I want. And then I miss the whole big picture. But if I let Jesus sit on the throne of my heart, then I let love reign in my heart. And now I'm making different types of decisions. I, I'm, I'm putting other people first. I'm living less selfishly. I'm, I'm, I'm living sacrificially, actually, because more and more of that spirit is getting hold of me. And so when it comes to the way that we speak, act, and live, and talk, and everything, there can only really be one king. And that's the ultimate reality there. And basically, if Jesus is dead, what I just said means a hill of beans. It means absolutely nothing. But if he's alive, that completely changes everything. You know, I mean, all of a sudden you have the ultimate king now, infinitely high yet humble. Wow. And secondly, it was love that kept him on that cross. Love overcame death. Three days after he's crucified and laid in the tomb, to everybody's shock and amazement, he appears in bodily form to the disciples and to many, many, many others. And he's talking with them, he's eating with them, he's walking with them. For 40 days later, it appeared to as many as 500 people. They seen him, they seen him killed. 
And now all of a sudden they knew he was dead. And now all of a sudden he's eating with them. Ghosts don't eat. Plus he could walk through a wall. That's so cool. I can't wait to do that. But then, then he had a piece of fish when he got on the other side. So he ate. Wow. You know, it was love that caused this. All this was done out of love. You know, it's all about love when you think about it. His resurrection is the proof that he was indeed the true king of all. There was an artist named Paul Gustave Doré, and he died in the late 1800s. He lost his passport when he was traveling through Europe. And he came to a border crossing, and he wanted to get across, and he tells the guard about his predicament. And the guard says, I'm sorry, man, but I need some proof. You know, the guard went and talked to the official. He's supposed to be this guy, Doré, a famous artist. But, you know, they weren't too impressed. They said, no, we need proof. And he insisted, look, I'm who I claim to be. And the guard goes, okay, let's give him a little bit of a test. So they give him a piece of paper and a pencil. And they said, you know, if you, who you say you are, sketch several people nearby. And Doré did it so quickly and so skillfully that the guard was convinced he was indeed who we claim to be. His work confirmed his word. Jesus' work confirms his word as well. They were all doubting him and they're mocking him. But death couldn't hold him and the grave couldn't keep him and love had the final say. You know, and we find that in the most popular passage in scripture. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave. This is, why, this is why the whole thing happened. He loved the world so much that he gave. God is a giver. Love gives. Love doesn't take, 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 take. Love gives. That he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, we're the whoever's, <laughs> whoever. What do you mean? That guy over there, who, you know, he's kind of, yeah, whoever, whoever. Oh, what about, yeah, whoever. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to live and die. And when we put our faith, hope, and trust in his life, death, and resurrection, then we will be saved. How cool is that? Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's why we celebrate today. That's what today is all about. And it's not just a resurrection for, for Jesus in the grave, too. It's a resurrection for all of our loved ones that we miss, all the people that have gone on before. What a day that's going to be. We have an opportunity, and we've been given an opportunity for eternal life. And we know that because of Jesus, the worst thing that can happen to us won't be the last thing to happen to us because we will experience that resurrection and new life. After he was resurrected, he said the final words after the 40 days, he said the final words to his followers before the ascension. Someone's last words before you don't see them anymore are usually very important. This is what he said in Matthew then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you, and surely I am with you always until the ends of the age. Easter is the day that all authority was given to Jesus Christ on heaven and earth. The title deed to the earth went boosh, just like that. After accomplishing all our salvation, everything that he did, the Father gave him everything, everything, God the Father. And he will reign, and that love will reign until evil and suffering are gone forever. And the love of God was the authority that's doing all of that. It was all about love. i got to drill that in and drill that in and drill that in. The final instructions to his followers. He said, go in the world and make disciples. We don't use that word disciples anymore. It's kind of a, uh, what? You know, it sounds like you're building an army. But, but a disciple, Matthäus, it comes from a Greek word, Matthäus, and it just means a student or learner. Basically what he said was, hey, guys, in my paraphrase, go and tell people what you saw. Go and tell people you saw me alive. Tell them of the works that I did. My works confirmed who I was. But the miracles I did totally were above nature. You saw what I did. They confirmed who I was. And go and tell, teach them, teach them, you saw me, you saw them put me to death, teach them that it wasn't the final say, that I'm still alive and I'm going around. So you go and you tell people. And it comes down to like a, just an each one teach one. It comes down to being a lifelong learner and being open, being teachable. That's what it really comes, that's what living it out, what he put in, that's what it comes to. So thirdly, let love reign in you. Didn't Roger Daltrey have a song, Love Reign Over Me, right? Well, you let it reign over you, but let it reign in you too. 
If you consider yourself a Christian, which you know, I pray everyone is here, you're part of that spiritual family. And, and that you have a part to play as well. And basically it is love each other. <laughs> you know, God loved you first and he puts that bigger capacity of love in there so you can learn to love others. And we allow ourselves to be students and learners. And over the course of time, we become more and more like Christ. And then we help other people. Look, I went through that too. And this is how God helped me. Maybe I can do something for you here. And the things that you go through that totally crushed you, that's the very thing that God will use to help somebody else. And that's, I don't have all these answers. I don't go through, we all go through different things. But God uses that. I wish he... I wish it didn't have to hurt so much, but that's just the school of God for some reason. You know? But it holds with a feeling of progression, too. You know, it's, to be a disciple is a lifelong process of becoming more and more like Christ. That's what it is. And we like to say, you know, Jesus lives in our heart, but Grandpa lives in our bones. You know? So, I mean, that messy room is still there at times. You know? So we have a progression moving forward, but there's also that other, there's, there's a negative process and there's a positive process. But it seems to always be there, right? But when we submit to the love of Christ, we're compelled to live like him. Not behavior modification, set of rules, I have to do this, this, this. If you're doing it like that, forget it. You'll never, it's tug of war, you're never going to win that war. But if you behold, if you behold, if you stare into the beholding of the holy other, you'll see after a time, those things just kind of go away. And you start being more loving and being more compassionate. Over time, we learn to live more generous lives and more, um, we learn to forgive each other. We learn to forgive ourselves. I think that's where we have to start. <laughs> and then we forgive other people because God forgave us. And then we practice maybe self-control a little bit more. And we learn to be people of peace and we learn to be kinder and learn to be a little more humble and a little meek is, you know, power under control. It's so, you know, anger, anger's there. He said, be angry, but sin not. So there's a righteous anger. There are times when you get angry. So it's okay. Just It says it's sin not. To let it go after a while. Let it go. And don't let it cause you to do something you're going to regret. I became a believer at a very young age. But I didn't really, you know, I mean, come on. I wasn't fully aware of the decision I made. But I knew that Jesus died for me on the cross. I knew he rose from the dead. I knew that. I was taught that. I wanted to serve from a very young age. He grabbed my heart. I wanted... I was serving as an altar boy. I think all my cousins in Hoboken were serving as altar boys. But it was just something I just really in my heart wanted to do. And then I just met a priest that completely flipped me out. And I said, you know what? In my limited knowledge, I was like, this cannot be true anymore. And that's it. I took a very, very long sleigh ride. And uh, I just got away from the whole thing. But God never let go of me. All through my years, he would lob a signpost in front of me or a speed bump. You know, or put a guardrail up. And I got in a lot of messes, trust me. But then in 1990, I just stopped it all and I got down to my knees and I said, Lord, I don't even know where to start. But I'd like you to come back into my life and come in. It's not like you ever left yet anyway. Was, yes, if, if someone moved, it was me, not him. And then in 91, it was my first year going to Israel on a pilgrimage, not as a musician playing that year. That started the following year. But I just wanted to see. I wanted to see where Jesus walked. And I wanted to see these places for myself. And creation bears witness that the creator was there. I mean, you walk into certain places and it's just a hush. It's not quiet. There's something different about it. And that captured me. And over the years and over the years and over the years, you know, I mean, all I could say is I failed him so many times. And I'm just being honest with you. I spilled my milk so much, you used to have a guy following me with a mop bucket behind me. You know? But I just kept coming back and coming back and coming back and learning and learning and being teachable. You know? And uh, you know, all I could say is because of walking with the Lord, it'll be 30 years of doing ministry in October. And because of walking with the Lord like that, I am definitely a better brother to my brother Kevin. I am definitely a better friend to the people I am friends with. I am definitely a better mentor to the people I'm mentoring, and I'm a better pastor than what I started out with. I sure hope so. You know, but I, and it's all because I just started at one point and let him into my heart and let go. You know, and the final reminder that we're given by Jesus before he ascends into heaven is that.
he will always be with us even until the ends of the age. Maybe today you feel like God forgot about you. Now, I, I want to remind you that you're never alone, ever. And Jesus lives and dwells in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that means no matter what you go through and no matter what you face, you're not alone. I'm convinced, I don't know absolutely everybody here, but I'm convinced there's two types of people in the room today. You know, and maybe one never made that decision to let love reign in their hearts and to follow Christ. And I get it. Maybe you've been waiting for Jesus to prove yourself. And like I said, I had a very long period where I didn't want to hear any of this. So I get it. I totally get it. And maybe he hasn't proved himself and that hasn't happened to you yet. And maybe you don't want to give up control. You know, it, that word submit, who likes that? But if you think of it as the plan of God up on the top and sub is to come underneath, submit is to come underneath the plan of God. Maybe that's a little more palatable. But I want to give you a chance to just give your life to Christ today. So just to open your heart. And it's very simple to do, just to become teachable and to become a learner and to just let that shine. It's shining your light. Just the journey begins and let him take you on it. It would be the greatest decision you make on this side of life. To do it's really simple. So let me lead you in a prayer. Let's just bow our hearts. Jesus, I confess that I have lived on my, in my own way and under my own authority for far too long. I've sinned against others. I've sinned against you. <laughs> and I'm sorry. And I ask your forgiveness. I believe you died and rose again for me. And I welcome your spirit to work in my life and to teach me to love you and others in a way I never knew possible. I want to join you in this great work of love. And I thank you for promising to always be with me for the rest of my days. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with a sincere heart, you have now stepped over the line of eternity. Maybe you went from religion because we all got stuck in religion, right? Get up, sit down, ring the bell, go out the door, you know. And maybe a relationship will start happening now. And the secondly, I think there are, people, there are those of us that have trusted Christ. But we just came out of a global pandemic and maybe a lot of us are tired, man, and got, got knocked off center and frightened and scared. And it's been quite a, quite a go around, hasn't it? You know, so maybe you just kind of drifted a little bit. We couldn't meet for the longest time and... You know, we did our best to meet and do digital sermons. But if that's the case, too, I want to remind you that he promised never to leave or forsake you. And God loves U-turns, you know. So it's just really saying, you know, Lord, I need help. I need help. Three simple words. And, and put me back. What did David say? Create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Plant me firmly on the road that leads to everlasting life. That's David saying that. So David took his slide, too. But Easter reminds us it's not the end of the story. Come on up, guys. You know, and if you're, you're having trouble with it, I just want to remind you again, he promised never to leave or forsake you. And Jesus brings dead things back to life. He does, no matter what it is. If, if it's a dead relationship, Jesus can bring it back to life. If it's a dead-end job, Jesus can bring life to that job. You can go to that job. I'm telling you, I had one. I will, couldn't wait to get there because I just wanted to see what God was going to do that day. Easter reminds us it's not the end of the story. It's not. So may the resurrection and, and may that be the proof that you need of who Jesus is in your life. And may you let that love reign in your heart. We're going to be talking about love, like I said, for the rest of the month. So may you walk in love and just live it out. That's what it is. Live out what he put in. And, and I like walking in love rather than running around looking for love, guys. You know, I mean, that's a big difference, isn't it? We get obsessed about running around looking for love. Just walk in it and watch how it attracts to you. So happy Easter, everybody. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We love you. We're glad you're here. Let's stand together for the last song. Hmm. Let me bang on the drum, man.
risen indeed happy resurrection day everybody join us next sunday for love love reigns and shows you how to transform your past but welcome welcome have a great great day and remember it's not the end of the story you will see your loved ones again may the lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you and turn his face towards you and grant you peace and the church said amen, amen, amen. everybody thank you thank you thank you
Be safe. Continue to be safe.